All righty. Uh, this is Arthur Bush here on Radio Creek Flint. We have a great show today uh, for a change. We have Father Phil Schmitter uh, from Christ the King Catholic Church in uh, Flint, Michigan. Welcome, Father. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Okay, well, I'm going to try a few things I've never tried before, which is, is to uh, talk to you at the same time that we uh, have a couple slides here so we can get right away to your history. First of all, tell us about Christ the King Catholic Church and why well, it's a historic church in Flint and in Michigan, for that matter. Tell us about it. Well, yes, it is. Uh, it was founded in 1929 by Father Norman Duquette, who was a man who wanted to be a priest. He was African-American. And there had been three African-American priests before him. But generally speaking, it wasn't in the mind of people to be ordaining African-American men. And so fortunately, in Detroit, where he was, he... Um, met a, a priest actually that later was in our diocese uh, everything where we are now where I am in Flint was a part of De the Archdiocese of Detroit for a long time and so this priest Monsignor um, John Gabriels who later was a famous pastor in uh, Lansing at Resurrection Church said you know I think it's a really good idea that we ordain black men if they're qualified and have the training and all and so he was kind of a catalyst that helped this to occur. But Father Duquette was very bright, did well in his studies and so on. But he had applied many times to go to seminaries and they wouldn't do it. And finally, Loris College, I remember it's in Iowa, uh, was willing to take him in. And he had this training and uh, did very well. And so he was ordained uh, a Catholic priest uh, in 1926. And then later, the Bishop of Detroit wanted to send him to Flint to minister to African-American Catholics. So he came up here and started a, a parish in, uh, called Christ the King in Flint. And so we just celebrated our 90th anniversary in November on the Feast of Christ the King. And it's been a haven for African-American Catholics where the, the special thing is to really enjoy, uh, nurture the wonderful tradition of African-American spirituality. So the music has got a very good African-American or black flavor and uh, the warmth of think of the church and the joy and the energy. Like a, a, I've had a lot of uh, what we would call at other parishes funerals. And for them, for African-American folk that I've come to love and know, it's a home going. And, and so it's, it's, there is a sadness about it, but also a wonderful joy and faith and trust. And so I, as Phil Schmitter, as a man trying to learn my faith better, have received the, the blessing of uh, experiencing their uh, realization that God is worthy to be praised. They don't grumble and mumble saying, Oh, heck, why do I have to go to church? But it's like, God is worthy to be praised. So I'm going to go there and I'm going to be in there with two feet. And so worship is, I just appreciate the spirit of our Catholic Christians. And we have, it's not all African American. It's, I don't know, maybe 80% African American members. But there's some folks that appreciate the being in solidarity with African-American Christians and, and appreciate the dynamic joy and passion of, of the Mass. And so I'm just, I am so grateful to be, I applied once years ago in 1978 to be the pastor and I didn't get it at that time, but uh, it's just a wonderful place to be. I, am, I always say I am the luckiest priest in the diocese and that's because I'm here, so. Yes, or, uh, Father Phil, uh, in reading about, uh, of course, I've known you for better part of two, dec two and a half decades, uh, almost three. Uh, I, I did a little background check on you today, and uh, 
I found your name in the uh, New York Post uh, in a newspaper way up in Olean, New York, which is upstate New York. And you have been uh, someone who many people around the country have the utmost respect for. In fact, one priest up there in Olean, New York said, you were the real deal. You were the real McCoy. And uh, they talk about you as somebody who's been devoted to the poor and the dispossessed. You've lived in Flint all these years. Uh, and uh, the other day you shared with me that you'd been, you lived in public house. I, you know, all the years I've known you, I, I uh, wasn't really sure where you lived exactly, but uh, I was uh, really taken back when you told me that you lived in public housing for all these years. Tell us about that and tell us about your service to the poor. Well, it, it kind of, I came to Flint uh, when Bishop Zaleski was the bishop, and I had grown up in the town of Mason, which was a nice community to grow up in. And, um, and I said to the bishop, I think I need to be in a city in a big parish and see if I like it or my image was it's going to be like a big factory and it'll be bo kind of boring and uh, I don't know what I thought, but I was a little uneasy. So he sent me to Holy Redeemer in Burton, which at that time was probably as large as any parish in the diocese, a couple thousand families. And uh, I came to Flint uh, on Labor Day of 1970 and I was my, a deacon at the time. So I served in the parish as a deacon and did baptisms and help with various things I could preach and, and do some weddings and so forth. And, and I just loved the people. I just fell in love with Flint. And my first week here, I was at a meeting and Father Mike Matarazzo, who was the pastor of Christ the King, was at this meeting. And we just kind of became friends. And I came over to Christ the King to his house and Father Bouquet, although retired, was still living there. So I got to meet him in 1970 and know him until he died. In 1980 and and I just loved being there and so after I was ordained in 1971 I then went to St. Luke's and St. Luke's was kind of a an experimental thing it was connected with Sacred Heart and Christ the King and they would the priests would trade places sometimes and they never exchanged money but they tried to work collaborate on program and so anyway, after one year, I was then sent to Holy Rosary on the east side of Flint. And after I'd been, and, and, and as I was living this life as a priest and as an associate at that time, I, the houses that I lived in were much nicer than the houses I grew up in. And I was you know, kind of uncomfortable with that. Like, why, why is that? This doesn't make any sense. So I had some just kind of unusual experiences that, made me curious. I became aware of, on Carpenter Road there, uh, a large housing uh, run by public housing in Flint, a place called River Park. And then there was another place next door called River Village that, or no, I'm sorry, Ridgecrest, Ridgecrest. And most of the people were there on some kind of assistance. And uh, it was not, it was not super high quality housing but it was adequate I guess I would say and I felt attracted to go in there be there and try to come to really know what's it like in the black community in Flint I figured the best way to do that is to, to live there and not I mean there can be a world between a rectory and you know the distance to the, the houses in the neighborhood so, like I live in Christ the King's Rectory, because it's like everybody else's house in the neighborhood. It's a little house that, that I enjoy living in, but it's like everybody else's. It isn't like a really nice sort of thing. And uh, so I lived there for 30 years, and I found, first of all, that people are people. And most of my neighbors were African American. And I just loved the, the fellowship. I loved the spirit. I loved the hope that the poor had. I mean, many of these folks had been through very difficult lives and, and didn't have much, but they still had a great spirit about them that I, I admired and I am very grateful. I, I will, unless I live to be 100 or 110, it will be the longest I will have ever lived anywhere in my life. Wow. And, 
That's well, a, you, you've been a priest for 50 years, right? I, 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 I would be 49 years, December 27th, and then 50 in 2021. So be the good Lord willing. Is, is now, good. one of the things that uh, I also have come to respect and admire about you is your willingness to engage uh, not just government officials, but the public about issues that uh, profoundly affect uh, the poor and dispossessed. And, and having lived in public housing for three decades, now I, I, I see where that passion comes from. And you uh, just, just, while I was, just while I was living there, there was kind of an onslaught of things. Generally, cities and t counties and towns want to put their worst stuff that nobody else would want to live by next to the poorest of the people in their uh, in their area. So when I grew up in Mason, we had a town dump that was a smelly, disgusting place, and the housing there was terrible, and uh, it just wasn't uh, good housing. And people that lived there were kind of on the edge. They didn't have a lot of money and stuff, and, and there was a lot of insecurity. And so then when I was in River Park for those 30 years, they wanted to build various facilities. Like when they moved uh, Genesis out of Flint, which I was sad about, and moved it to the Grand Blanc Holly area, they wanted to put a, a particular company wanted to take the uh, medical waste incinerator and put that on the north end of Flint, right across the street from Carpenter Road School. And, and would, they would always kind of fudge the truth a little bit, folks that wanted to do that stuff. They would, so, for example, when they put that uh, Genesee power station up there, which I always call the incinerator, uh, they, they had a big aerial view of the land, and they showed Carpenter Road was the bottom and said, it's vacant across the street. Well, that's, that was not true. On the other side from that land was... Uh, public housing where I lived and Ridgecrest, which was also low income housing. There were some uh, mobile home parks that were trying to really keep a decent, uh, decent housing, but, but, you know, not, and there was rental homes and Carpenter Road School was there. And I just thought, why would you build polluting, terrible stuff right next to where kids go to school and where neighborhoods are trying to live life. And even there was an effort to put a prison right next to uh, the public housing, that there would be like razor wire. And, and, and some people thought, boy, this is going to be a great thing because those kids will get up and they'll see that prison. And I, I think they probably unconsciously, I won't deal with color here, but, you know, but you can guess who kind of thought, boy, that might be a good thing. And wow, we'll have this prison and that'll be jobs. And, but it'll also keep those people quote unquote, in their place. Kind of thing. And so uh, Reuben Burks, who just recently died, I didn't know well, but I knew him a little bit from kind of union stuff. And, and so I called Reuben. I said, man, I need help here. We, we need some help here. And that was when I was also involved at the St. Francis Prayer Center. And so he came to a meeting, and I don't know what he said or did to everybody at that meeting, but suddenly there wasn't going to be a, a jail or prison up there right next to public housing and, and and at that same time they also had put a compost heap they took all the leaves and crap from the city of Flint and they brought it up and they put it right next I mean right next to, to Ridgecrest Apartments and River Park and it's and when it starts to decay it stinks and, and why anyone would even think to do such a thing it, that's just how far on the margins many of our citizens are and often it's a matter of race and class and so I got involved in that issue and stuck with it for, for years and years. So. And, and at some point uh, your group uh, that you organized along with Sister Joanne who is also quite involved. Your Joanne yeah. Yes and uh, you ended up in court with this issue with the incinerator. Yeah. So, we we did sue. Um, it was on behalf of the neighborhood group and and the Flint Double N, NAACP uh, at that time. It was uh, E. Hill, Mrs. E. Hill Deloney was the president of that, and 
and there was a group of people that were so upset by these things coming in. And so we sued the state and the county and the township. And, uh, I forget. But anyway, we won in Judge Archie Heyman's courtroom. But then on appeal, we lost when we went into Lansing to the uh, appeal court. But it was, it was a victory. But then we filed a civil rights appeal with the uh, EPA. They had a thing where you were supposed, if you filed a civil rights appeal, if you thought there was some racism involved, that you would, um, you they would look at that, they would investigate it, and and the rules that of the of the EPA was in 180 days they would render a decision, and so they never rendered a decision in that appeal, which was around 1993 or four. They never rendered a decision until the day that the Obama administration was going to leave office in January of 2016. It was about 25 years. And you would say, what? what's that about? So then later, the prayer center was involved in a lawsuit against the EPA saying, if you have made these rules for civil rights appeals and you don't act on them in 25 years, that's probably a little excessive length of time to be deciding whether there was racism. And, and there was, I mean, I was in these hearings where, where uh, like uh, oh, Floyd Clack wanted to testify and another woman uh, that they needed to get back to Flint and they wanted to testify out of order. And um, they wouldn't allow that, but there were two other white folks that they allowed to testify. And of course, they're saying there's no race involved in this, but but I mean, on on the face, you would say, wait a minute, how come those two folks were able to testify, but the black folk weren't allowed to testify? And, and Floyd Black at the time was a state rep. And like, how could he not be able to to do that and then get over to a vote in the Capitol? So we were, and then the other thing was we kept saying, you have hearings all over creation. But you don't have hearings in, um, you're not having hearings right where the people are. So they finally had a hearing at Carpenter Road School. And when they came in, here's the folks, you know, from the neighborhood. And the, they had these armed guards around. And they didn't have them in other areas of the city when they would have hearings. And so, you know, most of the predominant group there were African American. It's kind of like saying, oh, you got to have armed guards around when African Americans want to speak up for themselves. Well, you know, maybe some don't realize it, but that, that's called racism. And, and so we, you know, so that was, a, so we told our story in, in the federal court in Oakland, California, in conjunction with some other areas around the country that had been ignored. And they decided, yes, that was racist and it shouldn't have been handled that way. So, and you're, so ultimately you prevailed eventually. Ultimately, we prevailed, although it was a it was kind of a painful, difficult thing. I mean, I want to I want to be out loving people and doing, you know, you know, baptize and preach. And, and, you know, I, I do a lot of that, of course, too. But there are these justice issues that have a long tradition in the Catholic Church from Pope Leo the 13th in the late 19th century, where he realized that industrialization was beginning to dehumanize people. And so, you know, there weren't enough vacations there. People were being injured on the job. Child, children were being made to work from earliest and not getting an education because they had to work in, in factories and stuff. And so he began to develop the right, he affirmed the right to organize, the right to just wages, the right to um, having adequate food and you know, salary that would help, help you to have enough of a life that you could really feed your family and have, have decent shelter. And, stuff. and so, uh, so that particular part of the gospel was something that, I mean, and, and the seeds of that is in the gospel. So uh, for me, that became a, a substantial part of kind of what I did. So Father Phil, um, one of the things that concerns a lot of people at this time is the uh, 
fact that they're in their homes and they're isolated and so forth. And uh, you have also had a long time to think about these kinds of issues. One of them obviously goes back to the questions of, of you know, how it, what it's like to be a priest in this time and, 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 and age. And, you know, having the uh, sex uh, scandal in the church and other things of that nature uh, have obviously created a lot of, of consternation by uh, people in this country and people around the world. And I, again, every time I read more about what you've been up to, and, and I thought I knew you pretty well, I just can't get over the things that you say that are so true. Tell, tell my listeners here a little bit about how you view that situation and how it's been handled. Well, you know, it's a, it is a terrible tragedy. I mean, I know people that were abused. And I, one time I had a man uh, talk to me after a funeral. I was there for the wake service that day, the evening uh, before a funeral, I should say. And he was in just terribly disturbed. And I knew this big family from a long time before. And, and uh, as we talked, it became apparent that he had been abused by a priest. And I was so sad. And he said, you know, and he had a, a fairly recent baby, maybe a month or two old. And he said, I want to get the baby baptized, but I can't physically, and he had a great deal of faith, but he said, I can't physically go into a church. I become ill. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I said, well, you know, how about if we have the baptism someplace other than in a church, if that's, I mean, having your baby baptized is the important thing here. And the wound that you have suffered because a priest has hurt you, we need to do whatever we can to uh, take care of that. And, and, and so, so we went to, uh, it was actually in his backyard. We had a mass in his backyard that we baptized the baby, which isn't the usual place that you do that. However, uh, given these extraneous circumstances and his suffering as a victim of this. And so the good news was that later when he went to, he began to be able to go to church again later in his life and he's now very active in a parish. But when he went and complained about this abuse to his pastor, it turned out that his pastor kind of didn't pay much attention to him. And it later turned out, and I knew who the pastor was. And it just seemed odd, like why would he not take that seriously and compassionate? Well, it turned out that person had done some behavior that was inappropriate himself. And so, I, you know, when I when I was in the seminary and I look back at the, the men who have made these terrible moral and ethical and you know evil things, I. I if there's no pattern to it. I mean, I just say, how could if I thought I knew that person, played tennis with this guy, studied with this person. You know what? How did that happen? And so, I you know I can't account for it. And I, in 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 the years that this was becoming, we were becoming a little aware of it. There was no real good knowledge of the fact that it's very difficult to treat that you that you can't have folks that have done that behavior around children. You know, they have to be protected. And so, uh, so there were a lot of mistakes made where they would be more concerned about the image of the Catholic Church. Gee, it'll make the church look bad if we do this and so. And, and they would just move them to another parish and to another parish and that kind of stuff. So that stuff went on for a while. And then finally, people began to say loudly enough and began to legally speak out in terms of prosecution and thing. This, this can't go on, this has to be different. And so I am very pleased when Bishop Boyer came to the diocese. The first time he met with the priests uh, in our big convocation that we have every year, he just said, you know, this is something we gotta really take care of. And I don't ever, one of the, I just remember him saying, I don't ever wanna hear any of you ever say, 
it was the victim's fault. He said, I don't ever want to hear that from anybody. That they are the victims. We have this place of authority and power, and we have to be really respectful and not violate children or, or teenagers or, or whatever. We, we can't be doing that. That's right. Well, so, uh, Father Phil, I want to ask another question, more of a personal uh, question. Uh, obviously, you're a man with strong faith. Uh, and uh, and you you've been someone who's lived in a city with uh, with actually which still ongoing uh, two major public uh, health crises underway. One is we have poison water, and the other is that we have uh, um, we have the coronavirus. But during your time. In, in, in especially in recent years, going through that, where people are obviously very stressed by the by the fact that you're, um, you know, they're distressed by not just the the fear that they face every day, but you have to be personally affected by some of this, you know, the stress of living with people who have been you know, basically society's outcasts in many, in many respects and people who, who just have not been respected as human beings. And then you have this issue with the priests uh, and, you know, engaging in, you know, despicable behavior, which reflects on, which reflects on the entire church, not just on each priest. And, and I guess, how do you have the strength to deal with all this? Well, first of all, if the if I prayer is is um, really really important, it, I, it's important to everybody. And I have to say, you know, at Christ the King, Christ the King Parish is a very prayerful, prayerful parish, and we all need our individual prayer life over and above, or maybe as a foundation for our life of worship and publicly getting together and so on. And and so it's really important that we have a relationship with God, with Christ, that, that when we act, that we're trying to say, how does what I'm doing reflect the life of Jesus? I'm supposed to imitate him. That's what we're all, as Christians, we're supposed to do. And so when I see terrible mistakes made, I feel very badly for the victim, and I'm grateful that I'm in a time where we've begun to respond to that. But one of the things is to communicate with people about it, to hear their sadness, their hurt, their anger. When I was at Sacred Heart at, uh, back in 2002, I guess, is when the Catholic Church in the United States was getting together and developing guidelines of how to handle these situations and what to do with the priests and how to deal lovingly with victims and all that stuff. And so, we had a couple of masses where during the sermon time, I spoke about it a little bit, and then I invited feedback from people, kind of a dialogue. And then afterwards, we had um, a social worker or two. One of them was Sister Joanne Chavarini, who you may mention of them. And just if people wanted to talk, you know, to be able to discuss and get that stuff out in the open. That is kind of, you know, Jesus would say what you, we talk about light and darkness and that we're a religion of the light. We're supposed to bring things in light. And obviously, this kind of behavior wasn't of the light because it was always hidden and let's not talk about it and all that. And so when you bring it to the light, then you can deal with it and get feelings out and stuff. And so yeah. it's very sad. I mean, there's friends of mine that were in trouble with these kinds of behaviors. And, and I wanted to be very faithful to ministering to the victims. But on the other hand, we are a religion of redemption. And so I wouldn't want that person to be back ministering with children again. But I also want that person to be dealt with as a, the, the perpetrator, as a human being. And so, you know, I think that's the other thing is that we sometimes have just said, this is a totally evil, bad person, and we want nothing to do with them, et cetera. And that's not... That's not good either. So, well, Father Phil, uh, I could talk to you for hours because you have <laughs> you have so much to 
share with the, the public. And uh, sometimes I don't think we get enough of that, especially when I think about the work you've done uh, to feed hungry people. Uh, you've had in your experience uh, involvement with, uh, of, you know, at Sacred Heart and with uh, Sister Claudia Burke. Uh, there are just so many things that you've been involved in in our community. The jail ministry, I didn't even touch on that. Uh, we were one of the communities in uh, the state, one of the first in the state to actually establish a jail ministry, and it was largely a part of uh, the Catholic uh, diocese that helped propel that into, into being uh, uh, a very important part of, of uh, our community's life now. Uh, so next time you come back, let's talk about that. Maybe we'll be able to go to the jail and talk to some of these people and, uh, and talk to some of your colleagues as well. I appreciate your time. Oh, I thank you. I, I, I always, uh, I, I appreciate your service to the city of the area. You know, I once tried to talk a, an attorney into running for prosecutor and he chose not to do it. He, he was too smart to do that, I guess. So it's a difficult job. And so I thank you for the years you spent trying to do what you could do from that office in terms of the city. I appreciate it. You take care. And I just want to remind all the people out there that maybe for just a little while longer, we can be patient and stay in place here where uh, we, can, um, we can beat back the virus. And uh, so stay at home, I guess, is the, uh, uh, is the word. And I'm sure Father Phil would suggest that as well. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Arthur Bush for Radio Free Flint, over and out. Uh, we'll see you next time in another exciting and interesting episode. Goodbye.